I think this is something we can do. I think it happens for me in the regional. It happens in every state I go to. And I think it's not always a Latino, but it's a person who's really, really interested in the work I'm doing. I build plays with people who don't have anything to do with plays. And sometimes I build plays with people who are starting to build plays. So as a good example, went to San Francisco, went to Chicago, and then just to really punish myself, I ended my summer by going to Ojai, California, and I did a 10-day residency, right? And I had nothing because I was depleted. My, my soul was done. I was crying when I arrived. I just wanted avocados. I didn't have any. And so um, I'm there, and they said, okay, so you have like five days. Let's write something. And I said, well, let's, uh, let's get some, some other people in here because I'm going to like bore myself. So, you know, we got like a bunch of interns right from Ojai. And there were wonderful kids whose parents are very rich, but God bless them, right? <laughs> and they all came in. And it was really wonderful to have five collaborators who stayed with me through the whole process quite put in the play, right? But that's one way of making an experience. And they had a, a tremendous effect on what I did. And I had a tremendous effect, hopefully, on what they did. So we can do this with one another. We can mentor each other. Each one of us, I believe, needs to be mentored and especially as senior artists, and some of us are really good mentors. Now, how do we do that? How do we take people on every step of that experience? It's super hard, but super, super important in our field. The only way we're going to get into the professional realm is if somebody gets you into the back door. I really believe that. And, and now that I'm in the room, uh, it's more than obvious that what's happening is there's less money, there's less interest in um, diversity, because these are very scary times. And when the money goes, we start to blame people, right? So we're watching the immigration debate all of a sudden, right? That's very interesting. But in the, in the, in the American arts, what happens is everybody starts to get very, very compartmentalized. So how interesting that the moment when we really need to come together, we really start to pull apart, right? Because we're all going for that same stupid little pot. So I would say that some of the tricks and this was something that I learned when I was with Monica Viva. Our biggest grant that we administered was a million dollar grant that was a federal government Ryan White money, right? That we did art projects with. So we didn't go to the cultural affairs department because they had so little money. We went to HUD, housing and uh, what is it? Urban, Urban development, right? Because they have money to do stuff that people need to know. And we did these really, really amazing, extraordinary Visual art pieces are, remember our safe sex uh, burrito? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, forget. We had a safe sex burrito that looked like a 7-Eleven burrito. It was wrapped in the same plastic. And what it was was a plastic tortilla. And it was rolled up and inside it had lube and it had instructions and it had condom. And really what we were doing is we were trying to get the HIV rate to go down in people, uh, communities of color. In our community, we know that you cannot, and I say this about art too, you cannot make a real movement if you if you compartmentalize and only attack one part. The re, the thing the one of the reasons why I think I'm effective in the art world right now is that I learned so much about the fact that the only way we could get HIV down was to deal with self-esteem, to deal with expression, to give people a voice, to acknowledge whatever was going on, to know that it was also a social issue, and that people who who get high and have sex are doing it because they don't love themselves very much sometimes or they're totally have like you know if you're that drunk or that high on something you're not even thinking about using a condom right so all of these things really started to play into i think the way i started to look at my art the way i started thinking about how we could attack the art how art could be just not one thing could be many things how we could speak to the community on multiple levels right so a good example is, you know, in the last few years, I've really been known for these Greek adaptations. I'm going to be totally honest, and maybe I'm going to make Cindy uh, vow not to, uh, to like, beep it out later or something. But um, the reason I started doing the Greek adaptations was I was, uh, and Minerva was with me in the beginning of that journey, was that I was really intrigued by how all these modern stories, these modern events, Seem to echo something out. Seem to echo something out in the world. So there was this young girl murdered her mother because the mother had put a hit out on the dad. The dad was a drug dealer from the south side of Tucson, and I read the story. And um, the girl was 13 years old. Right? Terrible, terrible story. 
So I go to Arizona Theater Company one night to see a, a comedy because it was like that story was so upsetting. And I went to see what's called The Mystery of Irma Vale. Mm -hmm. Does anybody know that play? It was really good. So I went to go see that, that comedy because I wanted to just get my mind off. And they had a little sale in the, in the Arizona bookstore. And it was uh, 10 Greeks for $10. Dollar Greek, pretty good, right? And so I bought these 10 Greeks. And the first play I read was Electra, the story of a young girl who murders her mother to avenge her father's death. Whoa! How could uh, something contemporary, something 2,400 years ago, marry one another? And we, are we still on the same cycle of violence and the inability to forgive? Is that what's going on with us? Are we still suffering the same things the Greeks are talking about? Amazing, right? But the real truth of the story is that I wrote it because I had three other plays that I really loved that no regional theater was interested. And then I wrote something that white people would like, and they <laughs> produced it, right? So my adaptation, my adaptation was acceptable to the people who are that standard audience, right? Huh. How do I translate me and my story to a group of people who might not necessarily be my community? But I will say now that they are my community now, right? Because now I meet them in a different way. I might not meet them culturally. I do meet them culturally. I might not meet them around race, right? But I think we meet themselves, we meet each other in another place. I don't think that most of us could relate to the story of a 13-year-old girl murdering her mother. Right now? Right. So that's just not our story. But I think we might relate to the story of feeling the rage and the hurt and the resentment of something being done bad to us and the grief that we feel for the loss of somebody. Right? So I'm always trying to meet my audience in an emotional way. It's the way I teach, I think. As I always say, you know, in class, it's like nobody wants to meet a character who's just like this. We want to meet a character in the agitated state. We want to be upset, either good, because being upset is also about laughing and having a good time, or being angry or, you know, whatever it is. But we want to always be upset. That's what we do as artists. We, we translate the world. We interpret the world, right? We are the mirror to the world, but we are showing you human emotion, because that's the only thing we can relate to. Right? I don't, I, I don't know if we have something we can relate to, but I think that maybe if I said to you that once... Um, you know, I was in love once and I got left. Has that ever happened to you? That somebody dumped you? That somebody dumped you once that you were in love with? Okay, there we go. <laughs> we know that play so well, right? <coughs> well, not super well, but whatever it is. Yeah, we meet each other in the emotional world. So I meet that audience in the emotional world. This is where I want to meet the audience. And I want to keep expanding out. And sometimes, the farther I go, the less language becomes important, the more feelings become important, right? So the connection for us that's different than maybe um, some fields is that acting or theater is very much about text and the body, like dance, but we don't have text. Text and the body, sound and movement. That's what theater is for me. It's an actor, words, putting it in this, manifesting in this, right? And when you say certain words, your body does certain things, right? Oh, right? And so it travels through you. So the connection between sound and movement, text in the body, becomes sometimes the place I start from. Because sometimes the audience is so complicated and so diverse or so crazy, different than me, that I have to just say, okay, we're just going to start with a very simple story. And let's see if we just meet each other in the acting. So I have some beliefs about the theater, and one of them is that I think that as long as there's one form of virtuosity, it's bearable. And by that I mean if you go to a play and the actor is marvelous, maybe the play is not so great, but the actor is doing amazing things, there's something virtuoso about that moment. Sometimes it's the play. And the actors are, uh, but the play is speaking, right, in ways that are stirring. Sometimes it's um, that set piece that moves in. I was telling Carmine earlier about this amazing set piece they have for Anna in the Tropics that turn. And you just remember the set piece. Not that you don't remember the acting, but you remember that set piece too, right? So all of a sudden, design, acting, writing, direction, all of those things coming together make the alchemy of our art. 
So we have to collaborate. We are not in a, a solo or a singular form. There is no such thing as solo performance, right? It is a collaborative sport. There is no such thing, I think, as singular dance. Somebody invented the movement, choreography, and then somebody interprets it or tries their best to give to do the thing you want them to do, right? So I think that this is, did you see my little dance? <laughs> that was as good as I get. So maybe I'll, before we start talking, I'll say that there are moments in my life that I think are really, really super important. One is the uh, embracing failure. And I'm going to say that because I never talk about it, but I was with Monica, but I had this moment of failure, so I will talk about this. Um, I had a teacher who said that uh, it was really, really important to actively look for failure and work your way through it because the most important thing about the theater is not the doing, it's the recovering. Everything in the theater is about recovery. Every night it's a different audience, it's a different energy, and your job is to tell the story as best you can in the same way you can, right? With the specificity that is required of Sylvia's direction, right? And it doesn't always happen because somebody walks in late and somebody's reading the program or they're like asleep in the first row. <laughs> Whatever it is, people will always disrupt your performance. And your job is to recover. So I had a series of experiences. One of them was very early on. I don't dance, and I uh, went to study dance with a, a group of um, old Japanese seniors in Gardena, California, and we did a, a ballroom dancing. And actually, we got it was the old Herald Examiner. Remember the Herald Examiner? I got a pretty good review in that, right? So I was like, I covered, right? And then one was, um, I don't sing, and Moni I'm going to blame Monica for this. She convinced me to do a cabaret act at a cabaret club. And uh, it was Father's Day, and we did I did, all, I did all the man songs, right? And you did the lady songs, and mine were like, my man, the man that got away, whatever. And I couldn't really hit the notes, and the audience was very, very kind. But you could tell that Monica could hit the notes, but I couldn't. And so, recovery. You still have to sell it. You still have to make it successful. And finally, I don't do stand-up. She is a famous stand-up. Um, uh, we did a stand-up where I played Frida Kahlo. Do you remember that? Also? And, but do you remember the review? Robert Hurwitz review said, and I still remember he said, he, he wasn't funny, but he was very interesting. <laughs> Recovery, right? You have to, and I always remember that what seemed like three days of silence in the cricket, cricket of the audience, which is actually only 10 seconds of them not laughing at a joke, right? Karen, oh my god, we talked about this. So this moment is a really important moment, recovery, because I think that my entire career has been about how do I recover, how do I recover, how do I recover. I've made all my mistakes in public, so I wish I would have gone to graduate school, Kevin, because I think I would have been a little bit better, but because I made them all in public, I think, you know, I had to sort of take the lumps of the, of the really bad reviews. And in my very first review, Elizabeth Zimmer, I don't know if you remember her, God bless her, what was the nicest thing she could say to me was, the nicest thing that Mr. Alfaro could do for Los Angeles stages is to stay off them. So that was my very first review, right? And then a year later, I was sublime, so fuck her, right? So second, second was, you deal with the reviews, right? This is live stream, so we should probably like keep it on the show. Uh, so second, <laughs> like, Lies, Lies, Lies. Um, so second is how how do you recover? How do you get through that experience of doing the work, having people not like it, and you experimenting? So you have to stay in the experimental stage. The minute we start looking for success, we actively start looking for success over process. So product over process, we have really really ruined it for ourselves. <laughs> The electricity goes out of the room, right? The electricity goes out of the, of the, 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 the body. And this is really, really interesting. How does a play keep living and breathing? So people keep saying to me, I'm on my eighth production of Oedipus now, right? And this last production in Chicago, I, this is the most I've rewritten it. And uh, I rewrote the entire play from start to finish in the eighth production. But you know what? In its eighth production, I finally figured out the play. Like, I finally have the play that I love, and I got really the best reviews of my career. But, you know, I really, really worked for that, and I really, really had to really think about how to tell that story. So I had seven productions to figure out how to tell that story, right? And I can't blame it on the actors, because all of them were 
brilliant all the way through, is that I had not found it in, in the writing. I had not found it in my writing. But if I actively am going for the product, the I want to be loved, please love me, it, it, they never do, right? Alec Mappa describes it beautifully. He says, you know, um, getting cast in a part is like having sex. If you go in and you want it too much, it ain't going to happen, right? And that's, I think that happens in art. If you work too hard, you want to be loved too much, they don't love you. So you have to be courting electricity. And I think the electricity is we have to be courting change. We have to be transformative. Our job is to change. It is the hardest thing in the world to do. And I have lost many a lover, and I've lost many a friend, and I have met brilliant artists along the way, some that I wanted to stay with for longer, but I needed, 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 needed to change, right? And change is what you have to do. And then you find your voice, right? Mm -hmm. So finding our voice and finding the authentic self is super, super important, and, it, and it's a hard journey. But where is your voice? What is your experience? Who are you talking to? So I start every solo performance class with, you know, there is a story that you want to tell, and there is a story that you need to tell. In the story that you want to tell, you are always sexy. You're always sexy. <laughs> and you're always really funny. You're always really funny, and you look really good. Right? <laughs> In the story that you need to tell, you're really funny. And I promise you, you're hardly sexy because the story you need to tell is something about who you are today. And who we are today, let me just throw this out as an idea. Who we are today as a culture is very interesting. More than half of us come from divorced families. Uh, is it more than half of all women have been abused, whether physically or sexually? Right? A quarter of us come from alcoholic families. So the obsessions of our culture, the issues of our culture, the issues of our community are extraordinary. So Marcos, Karen, Rocky have been doing a really interesting journey because the journey has been about mental health in the Latino community. Something we don't talk about, right? Something we don't talk about. But how, if we are dealing with our authentic selves, does that not show up in the world? Right? The way you want to be seen versus the way you need to be seen. The story we want to tell versus the story we need to tell to our community is super, super, super important. It is how we start the work, right? It is how we become valuable and we become central to the community. So for me, I, I respectfully don't have that problem we were talking about earlier because I am central. I am the community. I am a part of it. I don't start a project without the community. I don't start to work without those people. So when later I go back and say, uh-uh, uh-uh, Monica taught me this. We, I need to get paid for my work. And what does Monica always say to me? What did you always say? You should ask for, right. she always used to say, you should ask for 500 more dollars. Because <laughs> I always used to say, yeah, I'll take it. And then, of course, I learned this amazing lesson with Diego Gomez Peña. Which I'm going to out him right now. I'm doing this show in San Antonio, Texas. And I'm opening for Guillermo Gamepe, and I look at the, the thing, and it says, Luis Alfaro, hour and 15. I have to perform for an hour and 15 for $2,000. Guillermo Gomez Peña, 25 minutes for like $10,000. <laughs> and then I said to him, oh my god, I'm like performing like a lot, and I'm getting so little. And he goes, you should have asked for more. <laughs> right? So, you can't always ask for more, and you can't always ask for anything, but you can ask for more of yourself, right? What do I need? What do I want? How do I do this? I never perform, I never do a project without getting something in exchange. So in my early days of poetry readings, I spent many a night at you know, a Barnes and Noble, places like that, and it was, uh, if you can't pay me, can I at least take a book? And, I, and they always said yes, right? I curated the Game and Writer series at the Different Life Bookstore, and every Sunday when I curated that series, I would say, I'm going to take a book, okay? And, I, I, and they were like, of course. You have to get paid for your work, right? You have to get paid for your work. You have to value, put the value in your work yourself, because this is something that's not built into our culture, right? So we have to put the value in it, because if we don't, we start to devalue our own work. 
so hard, especially when we're starting out. I believe in the school of yes. I believe that when we're young and we're doing our work, we should say yes to everything. I've made many, many mistakes because of that, but I think I've also made some amazing, amazing, extraordinary relationships with people, professional relationships, and really done really good artwork because I've said yes, 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 right? In the early days, it was um, poetry, and I remember one day I had one, and it was um, men and their dogs. I didn't have a dog, and of course I wrote a poem about my dog, because I'm going to do that, right? And so you just said yes to everything, and it did yes, started to equal other work. So right now, there is an obsession with like trying to get stuff like credits on their resumes, but the truth is, when I first started, I just would do short stories and, and submit to every single magazine, and then what happened is that those magazines are really owned by publishing companies, and then the publishing company says, why don't you submit for this anthology, and then the anthology becomes something else, right? But that every one of those gigs has equaled another gig, right? And so our job, quite frankly, is just to be nice about it. Love and enthusiasm, here's the quirky little spiritual part of the tonight's uh, speech. <laughs> Love and enthusiasm have gotten me so much farther than my talents ever have. So listen, people in the American theater, I, and I know this, and I know this, not sex and enthusiasm, <laughs> not enthusiasm. People in my industry ask me to do stuff because I like doing stuff, and I'm, I like making fun art, and I like being in the room, and I like doing the work, right? And even when the work is hard, and it's hard a lot of the times, I have to be positive and I have to enjoy it. And because I enjoy it, I want, they want to work with me. Now, that's not a big old secret, but it's so hard to do. It is so hard to do. When it's 103 and you're on a street in Chicago with a sprained ankle and you just went to see these little fuckers in a prison <laughs> who are treating you like crap and you have to go back and you have to say, it was great. <laughs> I learned so much about prison life. <laughs> but I did. I did learn a lot about prison life, right? That I don't want to be in a prison, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's really, really important. All of these, all, and the way we enter our work, you have to love the play because it takes you a year to write a play, right? It takes you, how long did you work on Sid? Five years. Five years. I, yeah. One of my favorite artists in town, Nancy Keystone, A Critical Mass, right? They, it takes them anywhere from three to ten years to create a piece. And the work is extraordinary. But listen, Five years into it, as Emma will probably tell you, you know their bodies. You know who they are. And if they commit to you, you create something incredible because you have now become a family. You have the shorthand of language, right? So making a work of art requires your enthusiasm and your appreciation, but also you're the one who has to stay interested. And, and it's hard to stay in love with work. I have so many good, wonderful, talented friends who don't finish plays. It's really hard to write a play. It takes about six weeks to write a play, and it takes a year to really write a play. And then it takes, depending on where you get it produced, many years to get it done. So you have to be the initiator of enthusiasm and love for the work. So I obsess about the work. My job is to, um, to get really into conceptualization. I research everything before I start. I find a little fact. The little fact gets me going on a journey. I go like Alice in Wonderland down the rabbit hole, and all of a sudden, all these pieces of information start to say something, right? So, as a good example, the most recent play, um, Ruha, right, this Medea, I was trying to write a Medea, it wasn't working, oh, not coming, not coming. I go to visit this woman at the Getty Villa, a, a scholar. Why not make an appointment with the scholar? Who told you you can't make an appointment with the scholar? Who told you that? And she's free because it's a public space up there, right? So she was like, oh, come meet me, right? So I went and met her. We looked and nothing. And she goes, well, if you were really writing Medea, truthful to the time, Medea would not be an old shrew. That's a construct of all every playwright who's written it. Medea, actually, the Greek women started giving birth at 13 and they were done by 19. So Medea, at this point in your play, would really be 21 to 23 years old. <gasps> oh, that's different, right? <laughs> Just, and Jason was in his 50s, because that was Greek culture, right? So then I went, oh, now, as a Mexicano, I understand that a kind of interesting. This 50-year-old Mexicano takes his young bride from Samora Michoacan, he brings her to the Bay Area, 
And he dumps her because guess what he gets? He gets a mistress, right? And then he leaves her. So that's not everybody in our culture, but that's, that is about our machismo. That is about rules of marriage and engagement. So all of a sudden, I have a play that's very true to my culture. So Medea in my play is a curandera. She speaks Nahuatl. She heals. She has. A, he says, "Show me your heart." As she does a, as she does an incantation. She opens up and she has a pure heart because she's young. Mm -hmm. Then, as the play goes along, and she starts to feel that nobody will talk to her, and people keep saying, "You're a ghost, Medea. No tienes tu papeles. You're a ghost. What are you going to do here? You can't even leave the house." And then she starts to get this dark heart, right? So we start to see where the story starts to go, right? All of a sudden, I have translated once again my Greeks from 2,400 years ago to today. Once again, I keep finding myself in the connection to the world. But that's research, that's obsession, that's a little piece of fact. I remember as I look at Angela, Angela one day in a class started talking about her grandmother, the horsewoman, the cowboy woman, the crazy woman with the shed to show, right? Well, what no, is she? no, 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 you were thinking of Marisol. Oh, Marisol, right, right, Marisol had a crazy, Wrong Latina, I'm so sorry. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just playing, I'm just playing. I'm just playing. Um, but you have a crazy grandmother, right? <laughs> she, had a wonderful, she had a wonderful grandmother. Okay, tell us about the wonderful wild one. Uh, Weezer. Weezer. She's the one that I took care of. Yes. And what was wild and crazy about her? Personality. Love it. She's so busy, like down, you know, just smoking. She's like, what? I don't have sex. I don't have sex. <laughs> really. Like, so that image stays with you, right? The, the progressive, the, the frontiers woman. I think all of this starts to pay. And all of a sudden, everybody gets a little spark of something. And the spark is the thing you have to hold on to. It's the little pure thing that you keep in your heart. So I always say to actors when I work on a production, there is a secret in the play. That that's just your secret. You must never share it with us. That's something you're going to play. And hopefully it's going to last through the five, six weeks of the play. Does that resonate for you at all? Yeah. yeah. So just keep that secret so that you can keep the electricity alive inside. Because we know that at performance 78, you're like, oh, what time is it? Two o'clock? You know, whatever. You know? So you have to keep that. No, that's not really true. But you have to keep that, right? You have to keep that alive. I think that all of us have to do that as artists. We have to do that as cultural workers. We have to do that as community workers. So the connection between community and art, there is none. Right? There is no separation. It is one thing. It's one thing. It is community and it's art, and they both marry each other. We are essential to the life and expression of our, of our neighborhood. And they are essential to us telling our stories. And if we believe that, and we start to act on it, we never have problems that separate us out. So this is where I think it really gets interesting. Um, Miguel Algarín, a New Yorker Poets Cafe, I'll, I'll never forget uh, something he told me. I said, um, he said, you know, we don't have that many Puerto Ricans from New York that we sent to California. This was like in the early 80s. And he goes, um, we, don't, we, don't, we don't really allow our, our, our kids to go to uh, the West Coast. I go, why? He goes, because then they don't come back. <laughs> and he goes, so we, we need to keep them here because they are essential to telling the stories. They got to go learn how to tell the story, and then they have to come back to the neighborhood. And I thought, oh, this is such a beautiful image, right? That you never actually leave the place that you're from. How do you keep telling that story? What do you bring to that story? What do you bring to the community? But how are you the most valuable member of the community? And I think you are, because you are the truth teller of that community. You're not always the most popular member of that community, right? When I used to write a column for the reader, sometimes people would write things and say, uh, and I'll never forget this last summer, I had a woman who was very upset with me at one of the post plays, and she said, I just have to say, I'm really, really conflicted right now, she goes, because I'm watching this play, and it's about a guy who gets out of prison, and... Um, and it's about, he's trying to get out of gang life. And she goes, well, why are you letting all these white people in Chicago see our dirty business, right? And that's a good question, right? And I said, well, I believe that 40 years ago, we had an amazing movement that started. For me, it was the Chicano movement, right? And the Chicano movement for many, many years was a movement that had to be insular because we had to grow it. And we had to fortify it. And so I saw a lot of plays early, early on that where I, I call them the pat on the back plays that are really important plays, which are, mm -hmm. we're here, we made it, we survived. Stories of struggle, stories of endurance, but celebratory stories. 
and now I have to grow it. So my generation is a generation that's trying to pop that thing open and say, now, how are we in the world in relation to the world? I don't think that my Chicano story, Oedipus, is a Chicano story. I think it's everybody's story. So here's my little fun fact that got me on Oedipus. 62% of all young men, 17 to 24 years old, who go into a California prison, return. Recidivism will return to prison. So when I was in Illinois, 52% of all young men go back to prison. That's not a Latino story, right? It's an African-American story. Uh, there are a ton of white people in prison, especially in Illinois. So you look at that and you say, how is this our story? Can, in the same way that I go to see a Shakespeare, can you see my Chicano Oedipus in the same way that I see a Shakespeare that's not Latino, right? But he is Latino Shakespeare, isn't he? Because when you see it, you see yourself in those stories, right? <laughs> so we have to see each other in each other's cultures, and we have to be brave enough to open the door and say, well, this is who we are, fault and all, right? But we also have to tell the good stories, the celebratory stories, right? And we also have to tell the complicated stories. There are a good deal of our young men, right? So now we're hearing that half of our Latino young men in L.A. County do not graduate high school. That is a serious, serious problem, the education of our community. Education is a direct correlation to prison life, the lack of it. We know that. We know that's a fact, right? We know that it also equals mental health issues. We also know that it equals access issues. So one of the agencies I visited in Chicago, they were doing a very interesting program. They were, as soon as you get out of prison, you sign a contract, you go to a GED class, you get through the GED class in twice the time. So they're like, it's like hardcore school, right? The reason they're doing that is they're trying to get you into job placement. You can't get into job placement unless you get your GED. If you get into job placement, you get some sort of security. Then you can qualify for some housing, blah, 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 blah. So you're watching that and you're saying, all of this is our story and everybody's story. Young people are everybody's story. And young people in prison are our story. <laughs> Right. So, does anybody know the number is a interesting number uh, per year, which is I was told it's ninety two thousand, and to educate a young person for a year was thirty three thousand. So it's worth the investment, right? What are we going to do about that? So what I do is I go and visit the nonprofit. I tell my story at night, and then I have the conversation with them. Now, the only thing I'm being hired for is to tell the story at night, right? Not to have the conversation or go to the visit. But those things make one big gigantic alchemy, right? Make the art really interesting. Here are our ways of doing it. So, in Chicago, I look, first preview, there are no Latinos. <laughs> the third largest Hispanic city in the U.S., and there are no Latinos. So I said to the artistic director, it was wonderful, Che Yu, and I said to him, Che, we, um, we got to like, we got to get, and he said, well, if you get them, Bring them in, but you got to raise the money for it. I said, absolutely. I wrote the most stupidest little uh, speech. Our, our edifice comes out and says, thank you so much. We're so valuable to have you here. We want to bring 130 kids to this experience. It costs $15. We would love for you. We're going to have these little bags. You can throw in a dollar, $5, whatever it is. First one we did, $842. Right? We never got the little $500 in donations. <laughs> Some people went up and said, I will buy 10 tickets for 10 kids. You take the tickets, you decide who they are. So we got made a partnership with, a, it was called um, Avizu, Pedro Avizu of Puerto Rican High School. It's a charter school in Chicago in a, in a little village. So we get them, and they, we get all these kids to come in. 130, 225, we paid for a bus. That's how much money we have, right? So we just start to integrate the theater. Now, we're not just integrating it around culture. We're also integrating it around, around age, right? An intergenerational audience. The other thing we're not doing is we're not sitting the kids up here in the balcony. They have to sit with everybody else. Because the way you learn how to go to the theater is if you sit one here, it says to you, please don't talk. I hope you say that, right? <laughs> or you're sitting next to the person who is trained in the experience of how that art is supposed to be. All of a sudden, that starts to make another experience too, right? So each one of those is just a way of organizing. So community and art, community and art, community and art. 
I never got through the slides, and I'm sure I've been talking for hours. On this. <laughs> so, um, does that pop anything for anybody? <laughs> Mr. Romo, does that pop anything for you? <laughs> Can I guess it? Yes. So, like, I, I was thinking of, I'm a big sports fan too, like our friend over there. So, you know, remember Michael <laughs> Jordan? Michael Jordan used to get a lot of flack because the African American community would tell him, you have such a platform, and he would refuse to use it. He just says, no, no. So, like, like for you, because you, you always talk about these very creative ways that you engage the community, and you have, please have to tell your taco truck. Story about Ashland later. Oh sure, sure, sure. But so, but where does it come from for you? Like, what is the need you have that you want to do that, or you have to do that? But I think it starts right at the beginning of making art. I wanted to do art to change the world, right? I don't want to do art just to do art because that's not what I set out to do. How do I use this medium, this form, to to change community, to make change, real change, political change? How does this story get told and somebody goes, Oh my God. I didn't know that, or I see that now, or I'm troubled by this, or I'm happy, and uh, this expression has hit me, and I can be an artist, right? Because that happens a lot with young people too, right? They go and they go, oh my God, I am a truth teller. I'm, I, I never knew that expression could be uh, a way of like living, right? So those are, 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 so I think it starts with, where is the approach? Why are you telling this story? And there's a big difference between telling the story um, for the sake of changing the community and telling the honest story because it's going to do something. Does that make sense? So for me, I think it's, I have some truths I want to tell about the world. I have some facts I've heard. I have a point of view, and above all else, POV, right? Above all else, a point of view. Without a point of view, we are dead in the water. I have something to say about the world. I believe something, right? Then that is the crazy, desirous point of view that drives the art, rather than, I am going to make her love me, right? Because then she's like, you're creepy, right? I, I, sound, I, I sound creepy when I say that, but I'm going to write the most beautiful love story, and then she's going to fall in love with me because it's the most beautiful love story. So I want to express some truth, some truth or some position about the world or what I believe. And that position starts to become the way I tell a story, right? So with the Greeks, it's happened, and with every sort of play, it's kind of happened. So let me very quickly, just because I want us to talk, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna like rush through some of these, but maybe they're gonna like point out, maybe make some craziness happen too with all of you. Is it on? All right. I don't know how clear this is going to be, but we'll we'll just try to make it work and see what happens. And I'm just going to kind of like do a kind of race to this. So. Let's see what happens. Check it. Is that better? Keep on me. Is there any way of making that clearer, or that's 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 what it is? Is there a little like um? Make it clearer button. We'll make it clearer. Yeah. Is there like a magic make it clearer button? Oh. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's getting it. Was it there? How's that? Is it good? I'll go really. There's like three. Yeah, yeah, one, I think. one or two. <laughs> that's the worst. Now or now? Okay, so let's say that that's as good as it gets. Okay. I'm going to read this really quick. This is the mantra I've been using for the last few years. Nothing is original. Steal from anywhere that resonates with inspiration or fuels your imagination. Devour old films, new films, music, books, paintings, photographs, poems, dreams, random conversations, architecture, bridges, street signs, trees, clouds, bodies of water, light, and shadows. Select only things to steal from that speak directly to your soul. If you do this, your work and theft will be authentic. Authenticity is invaluable. Originality is non-existent. And don't bother concealing your thievery. Celebrate it if you feel like it. In any case, always remember what Jean-Luc Godard said. 
It's not where you take things from, it's where you take them to. So, Jim Jarmusch, who's this wonderful uh, independent film actor who has done work for the, like the last 30 years. Um, uh, just early stuff as I'm going to start going through. I wrote this play called Breakfast, Lunch, and Dinner. It was a play, a disease play. It was a play about a woman, and every time she swiffers, you know what swiffering is? Every time she swiffers, she gains weight. So she starts to get so impossibly large that she starts to float away. And in the floating away, she has a sister who's afraid to let her go. And it's really about disease in our culture. We live in a culture where um, we have so much quantity, but not a lot of choice. Does that make sense? Costco? <laughs> and I worked with Diane, who was my partner at the taper, and I don't know if anybody saw this play, but I really wanted to see the big body, the 750 pounds, but of course, when you start, you don't get to see 750 pounds on stage, so we, we got two hula hoops, we connected them, and every time she got bigger, she would pull out a little bit of the hula hoop, so you got an, a, a, an idea of the largeness of her, right? What? Winston, Winston, yeah. And so what was really cool about it is that metaphor starts to fuel the play, right? Uh, you can't see the actual body, but the metaphor helps. But then I get to Hartford, Connecticut. I lived in Hartford, Connecticut for a year, believe it or not. I did a project because Hartford is the poorest city and the richest state in the nation. I don't know if anybody knew that. They don't have any taxes. And here's the deal. During the day, it quadruples in size uh, with white people who come to work in the, you know, it's the insurance capital of the U.S. I, by night, it's 47% Puerto Rican, 37% African American. So it's a whole different community, right? And so, no sales tax, no money going through the city. So what happens? No local clinic, no library. There are no, no nothing like that in Hartford, downtown Hartford, because they can't afford it. So here I was doing this play, but what I did love about it, and here's how you use politics in the theater. I got to, this is a Lisa Bocanegra, if you guys know Lisa. And so what I really loved about it was we found, um, they said, you can do the big body, but you're going to have to find the person to design it. So I got online, and I found these two guys who worked for Cirque du Soleil, and they were building a fat Santa for Radio City Music Hall. And they said, we need somebody to do the prototype with. So I said, well, will you do it for us? We'll pay you, but we, you know, we can't pay you a lot of money, just theater money. And they were like, absolutely. So it's these two guys, and they ran the wires and everything, and they were thrilled because they got to test out their fat Santa in our fat suit. So here's Elisa uh, playing. <laughs> Isn't that cool? So the backstory on this is the two guys were uh, big potheads, and we couldn't fire them because it was their design, and every night they would run her into that gorgeous wall. So that's the backstory. <laughs> A wonderful actor from New York, Felix Solis, who was in this, who really helped a lot. But it was really fun to see a character fly on stage. Um, so here's where collaboration gets really interesting. There was a guy named Robert Brill who designed Cabaret on Broadway. I love this guy. He's a great designer. He's a Filipino. He's from Stockton, California. So immediately we bonded, and I said to him, I would like to help with the design. And he went, oh, right? Because when the playwright wants to help with the design, I go, I have this idea. You know what Mentos are? They're those little white candies. I picture Mentos on the floor, and all the furniture moves on the Mentos. And he got so excited that that was the design. So this is the design, and this is what it actually came out to. And this is Oregon Shakespeare Festival. We did the play there. And we used an actress from Chicago, Sandra Marquez, who's thin as a rail. And it was really, really fun. And Chris Acebo, wonderful Chris, designed this. I don't know if you guys know wonderful, uh, um, uh, uh, what's his name? Renee. 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 Yeah. Zila Mendoza. I love the fat suits. <laughs> Um, I, I wanted to post this picture because this is so, something really interesting about the theater, especially about acting. Elisa got through that performance because she studies Alexander technique. Has anybody ever done Alexander? It's super, super important, um, and everybody should do it. But she did Alexander because every night we, to come into the scene, she'd have to be uh, laying down like this, and then she'd have to uh, uh, straighten herself with her core, right? So for dancers, it's super important. For Sandra, um, it was a big challenge because we were in rep with four other plays. So every night they have to bring her on like this on the wires. They bring her upside down. They go like this, and then she straightens herself into the scene because she couldn't mess up the lighting plot for the other shows. Uh -huh. Unfortunately, a few weeks into the run, she threw out her back, which was such a bummer. 
Second, the understudy goes in, she throws out her back. Then the standby, who should have been like, I ain't fucking do this, goes in and throws out her back. So it was a disaster show. So 